This is Talking Mule Deer with your hosts, Steve Belinda and Jody Stemmler. Talking Mule Deer takes you on a journey to learn more about the Mule Deer Foundation, Mule Deer and black tailed Deer Biology and Management, tips and tactics for hunting, conservation issues, and even features some of our corporate and celebrity partners. Now, let's start talking Mule Deer. Hey, this is Jody Stemmler, and we are talking mule deer at the North American Wildlife and Natural Resources Conference. And I'm Steve Belinda, and right now we're talking to two very important partners of the mule tutus. deer fund. Tutus. Tutus. We're talking to tutus. Yeah. Uh, He's got one on, too. No, two, two very important partners to the Mule Deer Foundation. We have Andy Treharn from the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation and Nephi Cole from the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for having Thanks us. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what you guys are up to these days. We really want to hear particularly about the state stuff you're up to. Sure. Well, first let's start with, because you're both Westerners, right? We are, yes. I heard you might be abandoning us in the West. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm moving. No, 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 he's still a Westerner. Always yeah, Westerner. okay. <laughs> all right, all right. Just as we're always Easterners, so, Daddy. Well, that's so. true. That's uh, true. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Westerner, born and raised in Colorado, and... Uh, I've done a couple tours of e- duty back east, but uh, Colorado's home. Absolutely. Um, I am the director of government relations and state affairs for NSSF that handles, and I handle, you know, primarily like I, I governor's offices are a specialty for me. I spend a lot of time with all governors of all shades in all states, but then also I handle during legislative sessions and, and otherwise the Rocky Mountains and the upper Midwest. So I'm everywhere from Idaho clear down to New Mexico and then once again from Idaho and Utah over to Minnesota. Okay. Minnesota. So, Minnesota. Now that's relevant. Well, beautiful Could, place. Nephi, I used to work with uh, Governor Mead, right? The I recently did, yeah. um, out of the office term limited yeah, sure. fantastic governor for Wyoming. Yeah, we he's he's free. <laughs> he's, he's probably loving life. Yeah, I think right now he's probably watching football. He's got a giant thing of popcorn. Huh? Yeah. Um, just sleeping in. His gut doesn't hurt anymore. You know, he's working out. That's what it is. He used to get up. So I worked for him for six years. Um, and uh, this guy would get up at 4.30 a.m. every day so he could go to the gym. So if you've never met Governor Mead, the guy has biceps that are, like, bigger around he, than my he's, head. He's yeah. in good shape. A, his yeah. handshake would hurt you if you... Yeah, you know. and, he, and, just, and then he'd go home and eat steak and eggs for breakfast and read. And, like, the man, like, would, like, you, you know, you'd write a brief. And we have a, you know, decent-sized policy staff, but you'd brief him on everything. He would know the subjects when you went into meetings with him and an agency head from BLM or some, you know, to talk about any type of thing. He would have it down pat. He would absolutely know what was going on. And you'd, you know, you'd have the reservoir information kind of that you'd bring in the background in case he had an additional question. But it's not like you had to. It, it's not like he he had to look over at you like. And, and prod you for some fact that he didn't know in that meeting. The guy so, is so Nephi, I, awesome. I've written a lot of congressional briefs and, and briefs for high, people higher up as a biologist. You start at eight pages, but you got to get it down to that half page yeah. page, and that's some of the hardest things you he can do. He wants it in eight. Yeah. So he'll get the talking points. Really? Yeah, he'll get the talking points. He wants the talking points, and he'll hit the talking points. But I but guarantee he wants to you, understand it. I guarantee you, he read all eight before he went in. And if he has a question, he'll go through talking point, and an agency head will say something. You know, he'll have that brief in the back of his head so that he can ask the tough question. And then then he'd look over at you to see, like when the agency <laughs> responded, he'd look over at you to see whether you're giving the head nod or whether, and he'd invite you to, like, if you had the, the counterpoint, that's when the staff would bring the counterpoint. Oh, good, good. It's just a, but he, I mean, he, he demanded, I mean, and he, he, I say he demanded it, but the reality is, like, the guy just performed at such a high level that you felt an obligation as part of his team, you got to, You had to work at that level. Well, but, and he had to work through some tough issues yep, during his and, eight years. So. And he worked on, I mean, he's personally passionate about all the issues we care about. Um, we shot absolutely. with him down yep. in uh, Las Vegas at the Western Governors Association yep. one time. Oh, man. I've, and he did not want to come off that course. Yeah, <laughs> he was like, uh, Andy, I don't know if you remember that. It was like yeah. he and Governor Hickenlooper got into this little back and forth, <laughs> and they were like, yeah, and it's I, time to I go, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It wasn't even close. Close, but you know, Andy, you also have similar territory, right? Yeah, I've got uh, everything from Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, West, and uh, we've got a couple other staff positions that I supervise in the region. But uh, I'm, like I said earlier, here in, here in Colorado, and then I also do a lot of our federal land work as well. 
So you basically help us set up sportsmen's caucuses at the legislative level, correct? That's right, yeah. So Explain to our listeners what a sportsman's caucus is and what they do. Sure. So at the most basic level, it's a group of legislators that's self-identified as uh, either being interested in sportsmen's issues or being supportive of their sportsmen women constituents. So what we do at, at the Congressional Sportsmen's Foundation is serve as a resource to help them plan events. Uh, we try to bring them together uh, from various states through our National Assembly of Sportsmen's Caucuses program. And that's really an umbrella where uh, we nest all of these sportsmen's caucuses in various states under and allow them to share information. And you bring them together too, right? We do. Yeah, yeah. once a year or so, right? Yeah, we have something called the NASC Summit. And it moves all over the country. Uh, this year it'll be in Georgia. And the Georgia Legislative Sportsman's Caucus is hosting. And uh, we line up a lot of educational programming uh, with folks from industry, Nephi's NSSF members. Uh, we've got a lot of the NGOs. Uh, Mule Deer Foundation has presented there before. Uh, the Elk Foundations, Ducks Unlimited, Turkeys. And we try to give these legislators that are making decisions about the things that we all care about uh, that impact us and wildlife and conservation good information so that when they go back home and they're voting, they have some strong background. And uh, if they have questions, they know who to call. And so we can <laughs> help them uh, sort through that and give them some guidance and uh, also connect them with the sporting community. I mean, that's a real... Uh, strength of our program is we try to make stronger linkages between those people that are making decisions and, and the people that are most impacted and, and those that want to help them. And you've got a, a governor's sportsman's caucus as well, which is made up by of most of the governors. Um, you just had a meeting in, in D.C. recently, and, and that is another level of trying to impl- impact wildlife um, hunting sportsman's issues as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the Governor's Sportsman's Caucus, we, we had a lot of turnover uh, after the last election, so we're working with some of the new governors to get them signed up. And it's a similar program where we uh, try to serve as a resource for them uh, when, when issues come up. And, you know, sometimes their staff members might not have a lot of exposure in the past to the sporting community. So uh, we try to get them educated and connect them with the right folks and answer questions if they have them. You guys have uh, have worked through, um, when I was with a Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, it, you know, some of the things were providing sample legislation, and I know the constitutional right to hunt and fish has been one that you've offered and, and helped some of the states work through. Tell us some of the other types of legislations that, that legislation that you might work with um, some of your state legislative sportsman's caucuses or governor's caucuses. Are. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really broad and diverse. Uh, we've got, uh, I think it's over 80 issue briefs now for state policymakers and that ranges from conservation easements to firearm issues and everything in between. Uh, We work on a lot of access stuff uh, you know and one of the things that we try to do is also create some uh, sort of a nexus between those state caucuses and the Congressional Sportsmen's Caucus in Congress. And so sometimes that stuff filters down. Is there actually a lot of communication going between state legislators and, and national Congress and senators? Or? Yeah, there are. And, you know, some these, these state caucuses are all independent entities and they have their own bylaws, their own ways of doing things, and we try to help them with that. Um, but, you know, we recognize the need to do things that, are relevant to a particular state so it can't be a one-size-fits-all approach but a lot of them are positioned and set up in a way that we can uh, have them weigh in on federal legislation that impacts sportsmen and let uh, their members of congress from their state's delegation know that there is support for that idea back home so we we do a lot of that and you know things like this lands package that that just uh, passed in Congress and will hopefully be signed by the president soon. Uh, That's going to have a lot of impact on the states as well. So something like the Land and Water Conservation Fund that's now permanently reauthorized, uh, 40% of the money that's appropriated to that program is going to be going back to uh, the state side of Land and Water Conservation Fund. And so, you know, we've, we've worked at the federal level for a number of years to try and make sure that what is appropriated has at least a percentage that goes back to supporting 
hunting and fishing access. And so now with this new uh, change to the program and, and potentially significantly more money going back to the state side of the program, uh, we'll probably start using our state caucus structure to let folks know that, hey, you know, we've got a carve out for sportsmen to make sure they get their chunk of LWCF at the federal level. Uh, we want to start making sure you guys know that you're going to have some more money coming back to the state side to see if we can work with them on doing similar. Well, that's that early warning, and particularly with programs that require match you need to start lining that stuff up as soon as possible and getting the state ready. So well, yeah. and, it, and it's important with LWCF because a lot of the state comprehensive outdoor recreation plans um, are not necessarily focused on habitat um, or it, it's at recreational access, but it's a lot of times it's a little local hiking. And that's there's there's nothing wrong with that, but being able to create, if there's going to be a bigger pot of money, making sure that this is now looking into sportsman's access or conservation easements or habitat acquisition, um, not just straight up recreation is a good thing. Yeah, right. and, that, and a lot of people don't understand that that plan has to be developed in advance. You know, if you're going to be asking for LWCF money, that's not something that you can wait and, and the money gets here. Now we can change how we were going to spend stateside appropriated money. That plan is developed before it's sent up, it's approved at the federal, at, at a national level, and then the expectation is that states are going to spend that money in that manner when it gets there. That's right, and it's a five-year plan. I, I, I know because I just worked on Colorado's uh, SCORP, and it is, it's a five-year plan and it's when it's done it's done now it's it's fairly general a lot of times but with big picture but that's probably something that you guys need to you know or have been or, or working yeah. on but as there's more money getting out to the states through lwcf making sure there's a sportsman focus to it yeah and, th and that we did work on the colorado scorp yeah. and uh, that was one of the comments we provided and if you look into that and if you want to find it uh, as a listener you can go to the colorado parks and wildlife website or google colorado scorp s-c-o-r-p but there is a section that speaks to um, hunting and fishing access, and uh, you know we saw a draft of that and saw some of this coming at the federal level and made some comments to the agency that were ultimately incorporated into the document that we thought would put us in a, the best position to make sure that we can at least have a chance of making this argument that uh, sportsmen have put a lot of blood, sweat, tears, and money into advocating for LWCF. We want to make sure that uh, our interests are also considered when the money's spent. Do you try to recruit non-hunting legislators into the caucus? Because you don't have to hunt to care about this stuff. And from our experiences, in, you know, in, walk, in, in doing what we do, oftentimes it's that ignorance level out there. If you would just educate folks, they become allies. Yeah, we do that. We And, and again, it, it depends on how the caucus in a particular state is set up. Uh, some of them have uh, very strict requirements for membership in the caucus that the legislators themselves have defined. And so, you know, things like you have to have had a hunting or fishing license for the last three years and be able to demonstrate that. Or some of them even track their own votes. And if you don't uh, vote with the bipartisan co-chairs of the caucus, a certain percentage of the time you lose your membership. Others are far more uh, directed toward educational programming and uh, you know like like ours here in Colorado there aren't membership requirements so we take advantage of that by bringing folks that may not have been exposed to hunting or firearms uh, in and you know we've had events shooting events where uh, we've got legislators out there that have literally never fired a gun and we like to show them hey this is a family friendly activity uh, we do it in a safe way uh, and, th and that also opens the door to talk about, hey, you know, this is also how we tie this to conservation and wildlife. And by the way, every time your shotgun that you just shot for the first time ejects a, 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 a round, we've got a nickel for conservation that comes back to your state fish and wildlife agency. And Nephi, I'm guessing some of those events are a big thing for National Shooting Sports Foundation to get involved in and help with. Yeah, we love the opportunity to participate in, in, when we can. And, and uh, the focus, our focus is... Uh, a little bit different than Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. So CSF, whether it's at the state level or the national level, uh, Andy's right, they're going to be doing a lot of education. It's they're, they're tailored, so their groups that they put together, their activities uh, aren't, um, what's the right word? I mean, they're bipartisan. They're not, quote-unquote, politically motivated. So we are probably going to take stronger positions on issues 
uh, in, in all, on a lot of issues than than CSF might. So for and and for for a variety of reasons, and so in and it, and also in some states, we're going to be quote unquote lobbying issues where you know they are going to be providing more technical information and background information, and that's just you know the nature of our participation. Right. So and both are extremely I important. Yeah. I was going to say they work well together. I mean, yeah. and, and you guys on them talk that partnership. a lot along the way. Yeah, yeah. it's it's very complementary, and it's just really parallel tracks and, and a lot of intersection in between. So. Yeah, and I think one of the things that it's important for folks to know, you know, as you talk about involvement at the state level and the importance of uh, legislative caucuses, sportsmen's caucuses, somebody might hear you say, well, in one state you have to have a fishing license and in one state you don't. And, and there are folks who might say, well, I think you should have to do that in every state. But there, you really have to remember that on all these issues, states are different. And the makeup is different, and the, le- the makeup of the legislature is different. And so if you want to be successful in being an advocate for the great outdoors, for hunting and the shooting sports, for your species or habitat that you care about, you really have to learn how to you know, learn your audience in that state. And you have to have a program that works for that audience. And so a sportsman's caucus, what it looks like in Wyoming, it's going to be really different than what it looks like in California. But if you care about these things and you want to be effective, you have to be willing to to you have to to recognize the need to use the tools that are available to you in California and work in that direction with those tools that are going to be effective. So and that's I mean, that ought to be obvious. But um, in a lot of cases, you know, we need to for this for us to be successful. You got to move past state boundaries. You got to move past partisanship and you have to figure out how to work with people no matter where they're from and no matter what political party they identify with today. So there's, we often work on a lot of things that are pro-conservation funding, all these other things. We also know you guys play defense. And what are, what's an issue or two out there that drives you nuts, that doesn't go away, that, that acts like a hemorrhoid and keeps coming back <laughs> to bother you <laughs> time and time again? Nice. You're probably going <laughs> to see us both say different things. But I, <laughs> right now there's, so, you know, you guys have talked a lot about lands. And uh, that's a very important issue. You know, we say that the the number one thing keeping people from participating in hunting and the shooting sports is access. Um, So it's but it's it's access not just to a physical location, but to the opportunity. And and I bring that up because as we a lot of folks, we concentrate on the lands piece. And you've heard this probably for multiple years. People saying, you know, lands, lands, lands. Don't worry about Second Amendment. And that's a big deal for us is the right to keep and bear arms and what that looks like. And, and again, that may be different depending on what your state you're in right now. But the challenge with that is this for us right now. So these lands pack, we're following this lands package, right, that we've all been following LWCF CF reauthorization for three years. And we're working on that. Realize it's on Second Amendment issues. I work with the states. These are things that are being, you know, in your state capitals, the right to keep and bear arms is under... Uh, ex- extreme pressure right now and the change to that where it's going to take an act of Congress for somebody to you know, change your access to public lands these changes to Second Amendment rights these are going through state legislatures right now you're looking at a one month a two month a three month time frame where somebody can come in and try and curtail those rights that's extremely challenging and it's very important to this sp- it's very important to the to the National Shooting Sports Foundation right now because when the election turned over we had not only change in Congress um, where you're going to see bills that are brought that are getting a lot of attention but ultimately aren't probably going to move at the state level those bills are moving and they're moving because at the state level you have you know you don't this this thing we look at in Congress where you've got well the president's a Republican and then you've got the House and Senate controlled by different parties there are a number of states where the chief executive of that state uh, and all the members of those legislative bodies, the leadership of both one, you know, both sides, both chambers, uh, they all share a common political party. So in a situation like that, you can see legislation show up and move very quickly that affects sportsmen. So some of those things are, you know, red flag laws um, for sportsmen. So background checks, um, that's actually an impactful issue for sportsmen, depending on how the law is written. And if you want me to, I can talk more about that. <laughs> 
Um, sure, they can that's, find that's information the uni- on, right on the so NSSF line. The universal yeah. background track that any transaction out there has to run through the NIC. Yeah, and yeah, the challenge so. for that is this: right now, about eighty-three percent of all background checks are actually getting an FFL. Somebody's running that. So right. even if you're not required to. So first of all, anybody who's a dealer, if you have an FFL, it's getting a background check right now. Um, most private transactions right now, believe it or not, are actually they're going into an FFL too and also getting that change, you know, getting that check. Many states required at gun shows. Um, um, the law applies to everybody. If you're if it is it is a felony for you to sell or loan a gun to somebody that can't legally right. possess that gun. So that means if you have people that are using federally controlled substances, whether that's illegally or even in states, and this is huge for people that think, well, you know, medical marijuana states, things like that. You can that's a it's a federal offense for those people to own a firearm. It's, it's a federal f- offense for you to loan it to them. Um, so those are those are. Those are issues. So you it's know. a responsible seller obligation. Yes, so. and, and that applies to loaning a firearm, right. too. And so the universal background check, that one of the challenges is that they don't recognize um, some of these laws. They They're don't allow you to loan it. Right. And so for you or me, I don't have a 300 win mag. I'm going to go elk hunting. I've only got a 243. You want to loan me a 300 win? Yeah. You can't. The and onus is on me to know whether you can well, be Well, right, yeah, right now so. it is. But if you passed a ba- – so depending on what the background check bill says in your state – and remember, these are state right. bills that are getting passed right now. If in the state of Colorado it's illegal for me to lo- – uh, it's and I'm, it, uh, I'm not saying that's the case in Colorado. I'm saying in the state of, of North New Hampshire – we'll make up a state. In the state <laughs> of North New Hampshire <laughs> – if the background check statute in the state of North New Hampshire says every transaction, and if it doesn't have a carve out for a loan, then if you're needing a 300 and I loan you my 300, even if they're, even if you don't have a prohibiting factor, if the law says for me to loan it to you, I got to get a background check or it's a felony, then I can't loan you that gun. Yeah. And, and and some of those, um, you know, we go to a shooting range, and that's those are the challenges when people are making laws that don't understand the issues. And right now, you have a lot of people in this firearm space who are who want to create legislation on firearms that don't understand the issue. We see that in the wildlife management world a lot. We're seeing more and more legislatures and even Congress wanting to dip their toes into the professional wildlife management world, which they don't know the issues like we do, yeah. you know, and it, it can cause some real harm. Man, so. it pays to study. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's, Those were the ones I was going to highlight. I, yeah. You know, that we've got stuff that's coming from all sides too you know whether it's some sort of legislation that's going to impact a a state fish and wildlife agency or commission's authority to manage or regulate method of take or things like that Uh, we've got that coming from some of the anti-hunting groups Uh, and and, you know they pick around the edges and and pick certain activities or types of hunting to go after first yeah Um, or you know conversely we also have folks that um are adamantly opposed to the acquisition uh, or conservation using public money of any land. And so we've got a number of states out there that have things like... uh, uh, No new federal land. Or, 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 well, not even federal. You know, there are a number of states, right? No public land. Yeah, Yeah. no no using state dollars to acquire things Mm -hmm. like wildlife management areas. These are big challenges. Well, we hear the ones about the wolves, the bears, but, you know, in my state of Montana, we've got a a prohibition against using certain science in wildlife management right, that right. they're trying to run through. And the, and the unintended consequences of that bill would be so far reaching. I don't think that the state agency would be able to manage deer and elk if it gets through. Right. So. Now, one of the things that, uh, that people may be aware of, but may not be so much Congress is not necessarily year round, but they, they kind of are for two years as a legislative session. Um, States State aren't. legislatures aren't that Not way. always. Not all. Yeah. So some of your, like California, I believe, has got a year-round legislature. Almost. God bless Montana for not having that. Yeah. Because Two it makes, years. So. Yeah, for all for us, you know, and we, you know, our, our lives get really busy at this time of year. So Andy and I are going to go, uh, you know, you have these states. So using Wyoming as an example, um, Montana may be even a better example. But in Wyoming, um, every other year, one year you have a general session where you the legislature meets for 40 days that's it 
the uh, the next year, every even numbered year, they're meeting for 20 days. They have to get all yeah. their business done in that time frame. So well, and they limited its budget. For, and uh, yeah. one year is a budget year. It has to be tied yeah. to budget. And you guys are every other year, right? Exactly. And so what it in, in Montana. And so what that does is it means, and that's why it's so critical for sportsmen. You got to stay up on this because we're in Congress. You're going to see them argue about LWCF for three years <laughs> and just burn the ground blah, with it. Blah, 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 yes. blah, blah. <laughs> when somebody brings state legislation, that legislation can hit one day as an idea. It can be law in three weeks. Yeah. You know, it, it, with a, it's, it's, it's going to roll quickly. And so. Well, and generally things, sessions are in right now. Right. right? right I mean, now. so we're yep. talking usually the first quarter of a year um, yep. or things are, are going on. So, so now is the time that you guys are really, really busy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's so, it, and it's, one of those things, I th it's also important to remember if you want to be an advocate for hunting or wildlife or conservation, that when you put that in the context of who these people are, uh, a lot of them truly are part-time legislators. Exactly and right. They have full-time jobs. They have kids at home. Yep. Uh, they're extremely busy people. Um, and a lot of them don't get paid very much, but they really are in a lot of cases, pretty normal. And uh, I, I think it's important for people to keep that in mind if they do want to get involved. Yeah. Well, and, and they're, it's, it's they're truly a lot of times these are people who truly believe in trying to make a difference in the civil process, right? right. I mean, and, and, and they have something they want to do, whereas you may have career politicians that are, you know, in higher yeah. offices. A lot these of times your state legislators they are aren't. not. No, they're Some doing, states they might have that. They're, but they're running a store. They are an Running attorney. a ranch. They're running a ranch. They're, you know, so it's it just runs the gamut. So when you talk to them, that's something to remember for us as sportsmen, as advocates. It does not go over well to walk into these people, you know, to and then to just and then to treat them like, to treat them poorly is really bad form because they are trying to do public service. They don't have access to the same level of history and information that you have on these issues. And if you can't patiently talk with them about these issues, um, when was the last time you, somebody walked up to you and just shouted, you know, shouted you down to tell you what the truth was and then you were like, "Oh yeah, I'm, I agree with that guy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do whatever he <laughs> <Right>. wants." <laughs> I or get like shouted at a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It usually <laughs> makes you do the opposite, doesn't that's it? Right. <laughs> every time, every time, and that's the thing that you know. That's how we work as people. When when people bring you facts, you know, most people are good. When you bring people the truth and you allow them to make the decisions based on like all the facts, more often than not, and hey, it's a legislature, so you're trying to get the majority more often than not. More often than not, they're going to go in the right direction if, if given the opportunity. But, man, nobody likes to be told what right, to do. Right. Well, nobody it's about a civil order. discourse. It's about it having a conversation and trying to figure out everybody wants the best thing for our state. What our opinions are on what the <laughs> best thing is may be very different, but there's usually a way to come together on that. Yeah, well, what, I, what I hate is when people just put all elected officials into one category. Well, none of them are sportsmen. Well, you know what, guys, gals? A lot of them are. And they want to be out there enjoying the resources as much. They'd probably be rather in the field <laughs> than in, in yeah, the halls of the legislature or Congress. So, the, you know. Right. If well, they're I, not sportsmen, make them a sportsman. Yeah. yeah. You know, but we have, we, we try and be very proactive at NSSF. We have programs called Plus One and others. Hey, what, treat them like you would anybody else. Use the opportunity. Get them into the field. Get them behind a suppressed AR platform rifle because <laughs> those are fun and they're great. And once they, their eyes are open, they, they're going to have a whole different worldview. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and I think, uh, you know, you were commenting earlier about, well, if not having had a, sport, a fishing license or a hunting license. And I think, you know, our world is in a different place. And we've had these conversations a lot about the general population, about, you know, there are those that hunt and fish. There are those who are adamantly opposed. And there's a whole lot in the middle who may not care one way or another. And there's probably a lot of people who will be relevant on our issues that may not be hunters or anglers, but it's trying to help them understand what it is so that they are either neutral or positive and maybe eventually becoming that plus one, being yeah, mentored into what we do. They will control our destiny. I mean, it's, there's no doubt about it. Those, those people and the decisions they make 
uh, will determine the future of, of hunting and fishing in this but, country. And right. again, it's that civil discourse play. There's a whole lot of discourse in our country right now that's not. Yeah. That is really uh, our own self-imposed echo chambers of negativity and of what we are, and that's not going to influence or help these no. issues that we're trying to deal with. And, and so that's why your organizations are really important. And I, I got a piece of advice one time that uh, has benefited me tremendously professionally and personally and uh, somebody once told me that you you don't want to ask someone for something the first time you meet them and I think to me that highlights the need to actually get to know these people uh, and demonstrate that you can invest in them as as a person and what they are doing in public service and and that's really what we try to do is create the venue for your for sportsmen and women to do that. And Andy's group does a phenomenal job of that. I mean, that's, uh, and again, the partnership that we have with groups like that and them specifically, that's one of the, the, the big things for us as NSSF. Um, you know, we represent the 12,000 firearms manufacturers, retailers, and distributors of, that, of this country. That's our membership. And so for us, um, you know, Andy's, like him, them having that huge tent that they can bring people in, that really gives us as partners the ability to go in and then and and to be introduced to them through organizations like that where we can say yes we are the firearms industry we're not the bad guy I well know and for groups like not. the mule deer foundation that have limited capacity to do what you guys do and what your organizations do that partnership that we have organizationally i know andy and i talk you know, we there's there's a regular every issue of our magazine has an article by Andy. Uh, well, usually by Andy, but <laughs> <laughs> he gets assigned voluntold. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> even if my name's not on it. It's but it's, <laughs> it, it's a way that organizations that don't that do policy or politics to still have a voice in the game yeah. and bring their constituency and issues by partnering with these organizations like NSSF and CSF so that we can get things heard yep. to the right people. Now, and Andy, you guys do, and I'm not sure it's in every state, I'm sure it's not, but I know there's a lot of Sportsman's Day at the Capitol um, or, or an opportunity. Um, is that something that, it, that if they go to the NASC website, the National Assembly of Sportsman's Caucus website, that there might be information about that? Or? Yeah, sometimes there's information on the website, um, and we, we often defer to the, the legislators and the co-chairs of those caucuses on how they want to promote those events but um, they do ha we do have staff contact information on the website and that lists which state that staff member and what's covers. the website again uh, it's congressional sportsmen.org and it's M -E -N a long men. one okay. correct yeah um, so congressional sportsmen.org is the website for the congressional sportsmen's Cauc uh, foundation and then the national assembly of sportsmen's caucuses the national shooting sports foundation what is your website where people can get more information nssf.org and i would be uh, I would be remiss if I didn't just point this out. You guys talked about this and like little groups and these things. And hey, in this country, this great country that we have, um, even though we may occupy different, you know, we may, you know, you love mule deer. Um, this other guy's Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Somebody else is the, you know, Sports Shooting Foundation. The reality is it, for the opportunities to hunt and to fish and the conservation of that lifestyle and that opportunity. Um, and even, con and even to backpack or enjoy, you know, these other, you know, experiences you have in the great door outdoors, we're actually all tied together, even if we don't want to admit it. And the future of me being able to hunt and the future of, you know, you being able to utilize public lands for something else, if we can't stick together on these issues, we risk losing them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Regional directors, our Mule Deer Foundation and our chapters, they work a lot with your state folks too as well, right? Yeah, so absolutely. You so know, going like on to the Mule Deer Foundation website, um, muledeer.org will also allow you to connect with your regional director if you're interested in working on state legislative issues and yeah. helping out. Well, you know, the other thing is, is if you're a voter or if you're, you know, if you're, you know, you're out there and you want to make sure that your sportsman or conservation opinions are heard don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call your legislator. That's what they want to hear from us. And the more they Politely, hear from us. nicely, like yeah. if I was saying. <laughs> yeah. But, if, I mean, so when they say you don't want to know how the sausage is being made, well, you got to be part of that process to have an outcome. And, you know, we're real lucky that 
guys like you and, and groups like yours, you're that flavoring out there. So when the sausage comes out the other side, it's actually palatable, and we want to we hope so. consume it. Yeah, so well, and, we, and we need we lean on those groups with that science expertise as well. I'm I'm not a biologist, and there are quite often questions that I simply cannot a- answer, and so. Uh, that's a two-way street, and it's important for us to have relationships with individuals and organizations like MDF that have that background and expertise. And, uh, and if I do get a question, it's not uncommon for me to connect a legislator or a state fish and wildlife commissioner to uh, somebody with some outside experience that can talk about you know, experiences in other states or, or just science. And as a sportsman, if you're going to go talk to your legislator, uh, and you want information. You want to. You want to. You want a recipe for helping make the sausage, so that you can throw some spice in there yourselves. You know, check our websites. So nssf.org. If there's a one, if there's a uh, an issue that's a big issue, we're going to have a fact sheet on it there, and you can go on there and see how we. You know, you can see our talking points. You know, and we would welcome comments on them. We would tell you to use them because yeah. then when you because it's more effective for you as a Montana resident. You know, Governor Bullock cares more about what right. you think than he cares about what Andy thinks. And so if you go talk to him, we just assume provide you that information and the talking points so that you can, so, because they're going to listen to you. Right. And so for you, members of the sportsman's community, um, please check out what we're doing. And we'll, we'll talk to you on the phone. You know, we'll, we'll prep you. And if we're going up there, we just assume have you with us or talking for us rather than, you know, having somebody that, you know, those, those elected officials don't care about because we don't vote for them. You know, doing the talking. And right. and CSF and NSSF, besides what's on your website, you both have email newsletters that go out with, with specific policy issues, both at the national level, the federal level, and at state levels as well, right? Tracking the capitals is yeah. the CSF one, and it has federal legislation as well as state issues you're working on. Yeah, we've, we've actually switched that up a little bit. And so our, our tracking the capitals is now a service where you can go onto our website and we have a bill tracking service that you can sign up for and customize to fit your needs. So uh, if you only care about issues in the state you live in, uh, you can sign up for that and you can check a few boxes on the website and you'll get email updates about legislation that's moving. Uh, So it's a tremendous resource for people to stay up on on bills that are going on in their state capitals. Uh, And then we do also have a a newsletter that you can sign up for on the website called The Sportsman's Voice. And that that captures everything from the the federal issues in Congress to stuff that's moving in in state capitals. And And you guys have bullet points, right? Yep. And we have, we push uh, stuff out from our website. Also, you can, you could sign up for that. The other thing I would say, this listener listening to us right now, remember, NSSF, our members are FFLs. We are the people that move, make, chip, firearms, and then the accessories, scopes, uh, you know, shooting ranges. Those are our members. Hey, join an organization. Um, you pro- you can't join. If you're an FFL, join us. You should have already. If you're not, um, join Mule Deer Foundation if you care about deer. Join the National Rifle Association. Join these groups that protect your rights. Yeah, we're not always going to agree on everything, even within the same organization. We might like guy A or idea B, but if you are not joining these organizations that represent your issues, no one else is. Yeah. You know, su- support, you know, get together. Don't be afraid to be part of, part of shape. Because, hey, Mule Deer Foundation, if you want to shape the future of Mule Deer, you got to join yeah. because you got to have your voice in there. If you want to, you know, you want to, you, you like where backcountry hunters and anglers is going or you don't, if you're not a member, you can't shape the organization. So be part of it. Get active, get involved, make a difference. Make a difference. Be aware yeah. and use these guys as resources. The yeah. tremendous organization. Andy will, Andy will give you good advice. I'm not sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do my best. Guys, thank you so much. It's been a busy meeting and a conference, and we really appreciate you carving out a little bit of time to talk to us here. So thank you for what you do. Um, you know, Pay attention, folks, to what's going on in state legislatures right now. Uh, there's a lot happening. So Go buy a new rifle because it, it, 10% it, it, of that is going to be for our conservation. conservation. Yep. 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 So until the next time, this is Jody Stemler. And I'm Steve Belinda. And remember, if you do get involved, keep it respectful, keep it civil. Thank you, guys, and thank you for talking Mule Deer. Thank you. Thanks for talking Mule Deer with Steve Belinda and Jody Stemmler. 
The Mule Deer Foundation is the only conservation group in North America dedicated to restoring, improving, and protecting mule deer and black-tailed deer and their habitat. MDF is a strong voice for hunters in access, wildlife management, and conservation policy issues. To find out more, visit www.muledeer.org and stay tuned for the next episode of Talkin' Mule Deer.